All right, everyone. Uh, again, uh, we're uh, very pleased to have uh, uh, Bernie Kapensky with us uh, here today. You you may remember him uh, from some of the uh, number of articles he's done uh, in in uh, magazines and in in books um, and uh, at at different conventions and so on. Uh, also, if you didn't know it, and and I didn't know it. Sorry, Bernie. That he. Uh, also the uh, owner of, uh, uh, if I'm pronouncing it right, uh, Alchem uh, Scale Models that has uh, uh, a lot of fine uh, uh, kits and so on like that. So after you might wanna, wanna Google that and uh, check that out. So uh, again, we're, we're very happy to have you Bernie and please uh, uh, welcome him uh, and I'll let you take it away. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. And with regard to Alchem scale models, uh, my big seller these days is the uh, photo etched fencing for HO. Uh, so I have a bunch of that. Okay, well, anyway, we'll start talking about my current layout, which is the US military choir line. And uh, I will start my talk with this little video clip. So first I'll do is I'll click that thing. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, you sound fine, Bernie. Okay, good. All right, so just to give you a little taste, I'll show you a little film clip on my railroad. And one thing I'll call your attention to are the red flags on the locomotive. Well, the red flag in that time means something different than what it means today. And so what I'm gonna do in this talk is go a little through, through the, oops, I don't wanna reach there we go. Um, I will talk a little bit about the uh, prototype back then and how it compares to now because you as a modern observer would look at a Civil War railroad and recognize it as a railroad. There's tracks, there's engines, there's freight cars, but everything is slightly different. And that's what I'm gonna cover in the beginning of the talk. Uh, I will then introduce my own railroad that I'm working on and uh, I'll talk about how I had some challenges in building it some of the methods I've used, show you some of the results that I've gotten so far, and at the very end, talk about some layout expansion. So what this really is, is uh, actually combining two of my clinics into one, and I've edited the first half so we can talk a little bit more about what I'm actually modeling. Okay, so uh, first question you're going to ask is, why would you want to model the Civil War? You know, I was born in New York, and to us back up in New York, the Civil War was ancient history. In fact, typically they focused more on Revolutionary War history because so much of that happened in New York. But then I moved to, uh, and by the way, oops, why am I, my mouse is very sensitive here, sorry guys. Uh, and I did have a train layout as a kid. So in that picture there, you see my twin brother and I with our HO layout that my dad built. My brother had a Santa Fe diesel and I had a steam engine. And for those of you who say that model railroading is not a chick magnet, well, there's evidence that it is because I have no idea who that girl is in that picture, but she wanted to come over and see our trains. But anyway, I moved to Virginia and living here for over 30 years, uh, you get inculcated with the Civil War history because it's all around you. In fact, the first casualties of the Civil War happened about two miles, less than two miles from my house, and that's Ellsworth and Johnson over there. And so I got interested in the Civil War and I was a former military officer. So I've always been kind of interested in military history. And so I did a lot of modeling in 132nd scale of figures and all these here are what you look at at 132nd uh, dioramas and things that I built in 132nd scale. Uh, and then I got interested in the O scale when Dave Schneider came out with his engines. So some of the reasons why I find the Civil War attractive is one, the operations are interesting. Everything is moved by rail or steamboat. Once you get off steamboat, you are animal powered or human powered. So a lot of activity on the railroads. We have the early stages of timetable and train order, but the rule book is very short. And so there's not a lot to learn. So it's pretty easy to pick up. Of course, there've been a lot of accidents since then. And each page of the rule book got written to uh, try to account for each accident. But in my era, for example, the, the rule book for the US Military Railroad is only 10 pages long. The other thing is that our engines are colorful. They have names, they don't have numbers, and they're, uh, they have personality, and they're smaller. So this picture shows an O-scale locomotive, an HO 
uh, diesel and an N scale SD50. So you get a relative feel for what's going on. The O scale locomotive is about the same size as a HO-8. So you can fit a lot of railroad in the same spots. Now the buildings are bigger, but things were smaller in the Civil War. We didn't have the massive structures like they have now. And then finally, it was the first railroad war. Railroads were used in ciliary ways with other wars, but the US Civil War was the first war where railroads dominated strategy and logistics. So now we'll just do a little bit an introduction into the railroads of the Civil War. And I like to start with this quote by Sherman. And if you read this, you'll see that Sherman is basically predicting how the war is going to turn out. So what was Sherman talking about? Well, here's a map comparing the North and the South at the start of the Civil War. And so the first thing you want to notice is that this is a war of continental scope. So if you can see my mouse from the Valverde, which is near El Paso, all the way up to Gettysburg, that distance is the same distance as Paris to Moscow. And so what we have is the Southern states have seceded from the Union, the Northern states are gonna to invade to forcibly bring them back. So let's look at the advantages that the North had. Okay, population about two to one, but about 41%, 42% of the Southern population were slaves and they were not eligible for military service. So in terms of military eligible people, the North had nearly four to one advantage. And in fact, you'll see that the South had 1.1 million soldiers roughly the North had 2.1 million soldiers. So the North didn't even use their full manpower advantage. In terms of economy, these are in then year dollars. The GDP of the country was only $4 billion. 3.1 billion was in the North and 0.9 billion in the South. Again, 40 some percent of Southern GDP was from slave labor. And my wife says, when you see that, you realize why there was a war. And these people were not just working on farms, a lot of the industrial output from the slaves was industrial, it was industrial. And that's what this chart shows. Of their 1.15 billion, around 40% was industrial output. So they worked in the steel mills. In Richmond, for example, Richmond had about 60,000 slaves in the city at the time, and they were working in mills and ironworks. Also, slaves were very important in building the Southern Railroad Network. And most of the railroads in the South listed slaves as capital assets. And when the war ended, they lost that value of those slaves because those slaves were free. Now, on the other hand, you'll notice the North had 10 times as much industrial output as the South. But even still, the North was more than a majority of agrarian products. So 1.5 billion was industrial. That means the rest of the 3.1 billion was agrarian. In fact, what was going on in the Civil War at the time of the Civil War was there was a grain shortage in Europe, but there was a grain surplus in the northern western states. And so what those railroads, the northern railroads were doing for throughout the war was shipping a lot of grain from the Midwest to eastern ports and then over to Europe. And so if you look at the four northern railroads that crossed the continent, the B&O was the most southernmost. They had about 30% military cargo. So that means 70% was civilian traffic. The further north you went, the less military traffic you had. So the New York Central predecessor railroads, the ones up way up north, they were doing only about 2% military cargo. And the New England states was about the same, very little military cargo. So as far as they were concerned, there really wasn't a war going on. Now, in terms of uh, industrial output, this, this little next uh, graph shows the locomotive production. And you'll see that the South produced 19 locomotives in the first year of the war. After that, they produced zero. So they did not produce any locomotives for the rest of the war. Meanwhile, the North was producing about 400 and the production actually went up for the subsequent years. And they were producing about 500 new locomotives every year. At the start of the war, the South had 9,000 miles of track, which is a pretty respectable amount. If you compared it to any European country, it'd be about the same that England or Germany or France had. And then the North had 21,000, which was quite a lot, particularly in New England. Half of that was in New England. 
And by the end of the war, the South was down to about 2,000 miles of operating track. One of the problems they had was because their ironworks were focused on making weaponry and armor, they weren't able to make new rail. So anytime the Southerners lost a rail, they couldn't replace it. And so if they did want to build a new line, which they did build a few new ones, they would have to take rail from other places, which hurt their efficiency. Meanwhile, on the northern side, they added 5,000 more new miles during the war. So they ended up with 26,000 by the end of the war. And that's not counting what the US Military Railroad did. So this graph here is an example of what I call the overwhelming logistical advantages the North had. And so up in the left corner, we see prefabricated bridges being assembled in Alexandria so that they could quickly repair bridges. Uh, the only problem with that is I don't know of any examples where those prefab bridges were actually used, but they were prefabricated. And they were shipping those to my railroad, which I'll talk about later. In the upper right, you see a row of artillery being stockpiled at City Point, and there's a rail car way in the background. But more importantly, you see an African-American soldier who, if you remember, I told you 40% of the Southern population were slaves. They were not eligible for military service. However, about 200 to maybe 300,000 of them joined the Union Army, and that further exacerbated the Union's manpower advantage. And then the bottom picture, you see rail stockpiled in Alexandria just for just in case to be used for future products, whereas the South had no way of getting new rail, the North would stockpile an extra rail just in case. There were other disadvantages or uh, differences between the North and the South, all of them ended up being disadvantages for the South. And so just how the lines were laid out, the South, South railroads or Southern railroads were oriented to bringing agricultural products to the nearest port. So they did not have one interstate trunk line that went all the way across the South. Meanwhile, the North had four lines and they weren't all one railroad, but they were related that did cross the Appalachians. And so they had much better interstate movement of uh, rail. The North also paid, the, the government paid above market rates for military cargo. And so railroad owners were capitalists, they wanted to make money. And so they were perfectly happy to ship military cargo because they knew they would make money. On the other hand, the Southern railroads wanted to charge below market rates because they wanted to lean on the patriotism of their owners. Now these owners were capitalists and they wanted to make money. And so as early as 1862, you see Robert E. Lee writing letters to Washington, complaining, or correction, to Richmond, complaining about how the RFMP railroad where he's deployed was not able to keep him supplied. And another uh, issue is that we remember from high school history, laissez-faire, private ownership, this was a big thing with the Southerners and they did not want to have federal control of their railroads. Meanwhile, Northern railroads knew that the federal government would nationalize them if they needed, so they fully cooperated, but they might as well, they were making money. Now, the, in 1862, the Congress passed the United States Military Railroad Act, which created an organization that was authorized to take over any railroad in the United States that the military deemed necessary. This was mostly done in Southern states as the Union Army advanced and conquered territory, the US Military Railroad would take over the Southern railroads that were in that area and rebuild them and run them as the US Military Railroad. There really was only one case where the US Military Railroad took over a Northern line and that was during the Gettysburg campaign where the US Military Railroad took over the Western Maryland Railroad for about a month and ran it at 10 times its normal capacity. And Herman Hoppe was in charge of that. Now, strange as it sounds to us now, back in the Civil War era, there was no interchange between competing railroads. And railroad owners felt that if they let their cars go onto another railroad, they would never see them again. And furthermore, Many of the railroads did not physically connect. And this was not as big a problem as some people think, but there wasn't a standard gauge. And I'll show you this in a second. So here's a map of the United States 
railroad network at the start of the war and it's color coded by gauge. And if you want to see this map in more detail, I did put this in my book on military railroads. So if you look at this, you'll see that the South was largely five foot gauge. And so they are actually more homogeneous than the North. All of this here is five foot gauge, except that one little crucial piece there, which is four foot eight and a half. Now in North Carolina and Virginia, you have a lot of four foot eight and a half, but also you have that in New England and New York. However, the Erie with their six feet and these other oddball gauges in Ohio, the North was actually less homogeneous than the South. And remember I said there was no trunk line in the South. And now you're gonna say, wait a minute, what about this? What's this railroad right here? Well, that's actually between Richmond and Chattanooga, it's actually four railroads and none of them physically connect. So you'll have to go into town, unload all your cargo, go across town in a wagon, get on the next train and, and head out. So they really did not have a trunk line. And you'll see if you examine this closely, there's some dotted lines. Those are new lines that the South built during the war. But to build those lines, they had to take up lines, notably this one. This whole line was removed during the war, and a lot of the sightings and such were removed. So what were railroads doing in the Civil War? Well, everybody thinks about the tactical value, putting weapons on trains and firing weapons. But it turns out that was very insignificant portion of what they were doing. In fact, this here, the dictator mortar, was mounted on a rail car. And after several shots, the rail car started to fall apart. And so they had to move it uh, onto a fixed platform. And here you see was probably the first railroad mounted gun ever. And there was a lot of confusion about this gun because the National Archives who have that black and white picture at the bottom said it was a Union gun used at the siege of Petersburg. But Dr. Schneider, the same guy who does Schneider model trains, who made the engines on my railroad, he proved that this was actually the Lee Brook gun used during the Peninsula Campaign in 1862. And it was used once, put on a siding down by Richmond and never used again. So why would this not be an effective weapon? Well, first of all, you can only go where the tracks are. And the gun itself has a very limited traverse. It can pivot a little bit. So if this gun shows up, you just move aside and it can't shoot you and you're vulnerable to fire from the size. So proved to be not very practical. And I uh, built this model and it was in the museum for a while, but now I have it back in my collection. If this is a 132nd scale model, by the way. Now the B&O and others did build some armored cars. The B&O used theirs as an armored escort. So they would have typically two of these armored cars and an infantry car that was wooden reinforced with heavy beams on the inside and that would have infantry in it and this gun had a small or correction this car had a small field piece mounted in it now this model i built for the bno museum and i worked with their curator because there are no known photos of this car so we did have a textual description from john meigs who was the son of meigs who was a quartermaster in charge of the u.s army and by the way he was killed in the war john and using that textual description with some engineering and calculating weights and such, we knew that they started with a standard boxcar. We came up with this design. These allegedly saw action and two of them were supposedly destroyed in combat. And supposedly a piece of that little armored door survived. Somebody has it in their private collection. So if railroads weren't fighting, what were they doing? Well, strategic transport and logistic support. And so this chart here, this map, shows an example of what strategic movement would be. So let me set the stage. The Battle of Gettysburg has happened in 1863. Lee retreats back into Virginia and Meade and the Union Army follow him. Neither army is really strong enough to attack the other. And so Lee looks at the strategic situation and he realizes that they're losing the war in the West. Uh, what's his name? Rosecrans has just completed the Tullahoma campaign in Tennessee and has driven the Confederates back past Chattanooga. So Lee tells Longstreet, one of his corps commanders, he sends about a third of his army from Virginia to Chattanooga via rail. And these red lines show the route that they had to take because they had to take different railroads. Those men arrive just in time 
Uh, some additional soldiers came from the Mississippi area and up from the, this Alabama area. Those guys had to walk that piece and they had to take a ferry across Mobile Bay. Anyway, they all arrived at Chattanooga and defeated Rosecrans. Rosecrans fell back to Chattanooga where he was besieged by the Confederate army. So Lenore says, well, this is no good. Meade, if you're not gonna use those soldiers, we're gonna send 25,000 of them to reinforce Rosecrans. And so they did, it took them 15 days, but four of those days were delays because Morgan, the Confederate cavalryman, had come up from Alabama, went through Tennessee and into Kentucky, and then went back. So these men stopped along the way, they were riding the l and and the National Chattanooga, guarded their railroad until Morgan was done, and then they continued on their way. Meantime, Ulysses S. Grant and Sherman are over here at Vicksburg. Grant goes up the Mississippi, sorry about that, goes up the Mississippi, and uh, goes up to Cairo and then comes back to Chattanooga from the north. Sherman marches overland, nearly gets captured in Mississippi. His uh, effects were captured in a train that he was in. He marches in with his soldiers. They reinforce uh, Rosecrans with the soldiers from the Army of the Potomac, and they win the Battle of Missionary Ridge. They drive the Confederates out. And at that point, Grant gets command of the whole Union Army, and he goes to Washington. And Sherman begins to Savannah and then to the sea. So the end of, that was the beginning of the end for the Confederacy. So that's an example of strategic movement. Now, this is an example of logistic support. So this is my particular railroad. The Army of the Potomac has about 110, maybe 120,000 men. They have about 60,000 animals, mules and horses, and some oxen. And so this is what the railroad would haul in one day. Now, the, the thing to remember about my railroad is there is no interchange with anywhere else. Every, all supplies have to come in by rail, by ship and then by rail. And so this is a pretty good indication of what an army would use in that time period. So forage is what animals eat. So the majority of the cargo was to keep the animals fed. The commissary stores are the food that the men eat. So that's a pretty big chunk. Quartermaster stores are things like uniforms, tents, replacement weapons, stoves for the campfires, uh, those kind of things, paper to write their notes and so on. Now, at the time I'm modeling, there is no fighting going on. This is what they call winter quarters. The army is camped out for several months to avoid having to campaign in cold weather. They did do that occasionally, but for the most part, they didn't. They just hunkered down because you would lose more men to illness and disease because of the cold weather than you would to enemy action. So it just made sense to camp out and and train and lick your wounds from previous fighting. And so men were going home on leave, uh, passengers, they were sending mail. There's a story I read in one of the letters about a family that shipped a turkey. They cooked a turkey and they shipped it to their son from New York, from state New York, to the Army of the Potomac. And I was saying to myself, how could they ship a turkey to a guy without the man, you know, without it spoiling? And a couple of years ago, we got invited to a wedding in Syracuse, New York on January 1st. And we arrived there, it was 19 below zero. That explained how they shipped the turkey. The thing was frozen solid by the time it got on the railroad car. And so they were able to successfully ship it. Uh, we also have railroad supplies. The railroad is constantly improving itself, building, stockpiling bridges, and getting ready to move on to Richmond. So they were hauling a pretty good amount of supplies. And by the way, each boxcar represents 10 tons a day. So 20 tons a day of railroad supplies, and then a small amount of ammunition is being shipped because the men are training in the winter. They're doing uh, musketry practice and the artillery is firing their rounds. So we do use a, a little bit of ammo. So at the start of the war, supply depots were pretty rudimentary. Uh, here's an example of boxcars pull up, maybe on the main line, maybe on a siding. You bring the wagons alongside it, uh, unload directly to the wagons or put the cargo on the ground and get those cars back. By the end of the war, the Union, at least, had extremely elaborate supply depots. So the Union Supply Depot at City Point down in Virginia during the Petersburg campaign, this is providing Grant's Army of the Potomac now with supplies. They had over a mile of wharfs built on the river. They had dedicated warehouses for each commodity. They even had to move the ammunition depot up onto a pier outside, uh, away from everything, because. The earlier ammo depot exploded and killed a few people. 
and they had uh, forage wharf, uh, quartermaster wharf, and you can see they have a sawmill. There's a sawmill blade sitting in the foreground. And you also see uh, an example of some of the cars they're running. This particular stock car gets a lot of comments because it really was a flat car that they built uh, to probably house horses for officers that were riding in the passenger car. Whoops, I keep going back. My mouse is very sensitive, sorry about that. So that's uh, City Point. It was the busiest harbor in the United States at the time. At the start of the war, interestingly enough, the busiest harbor in the United States was New Orleans because of all the cargo coming down the Mississippi. Now the railroad did build the first car ferry. Now there was a railroad ferry in uh, Maryland from across the Susquehanna River, but that was a ferry where you drove the whole train onto the ferry, the ferry went across the river and they came off. This was the first example of a car float type ferry and Hop designed this using Schunkel barges from the Philadelphia area. So they lashed two or three of these barges together and they put the rails transverse, not longitudinal. And if you notice, they had ramps from, in this case, three, in other cases, two or one. So that meant to unload each car, they had to move the raft a couple times. Now, Hopped, who designed this, wrote a, what we would call cost-effective analysis, analysis of this, and I have a copy of it. And he said that it took about an hour to unload and load the ferry. And I know from the records that I found at the archives that there was one ferry a day from Alexandria to Aquia Landing. So one ferry up, one ferry back. So it was being used, but it wasn't super busy. Now we like, as model rivers, we like our rolling stock, we like different models. And one of the drawbacks of the Civil War is there is not the variety of cars you have now. So there are no intermodal cars, there are no tank cars. Uh, but we do have a lot of box cars, flat cars, and gondolas. And within the box cars, there is a pretty good variety. And if you look at this picture closely, you'll see that each one of those cars is slightly different. The second and third one looks similar, but then the rest of them are all different. And this particular one here, 478, is a combination car with iron bars on one door and a wooden door on the other. So you could ship livestock, or a lot of times they would put lumber in through the long end and ship long lumber that way. And I built them all at one of those. So it's a neat car. There's also the Adam Express operating back then. And so if you were a soldier in the North and in the South, and you got paid, hopefully. It's amazing how often these soldiers did not get paid. It's amazing they didn't mutiny. Anyway, uh, you probably were shipping some of your salary home so your family could have some cash. And you couldn't use the post office for this because it wouldn't be insured. So you would take your money to the Adams Express if they were operating your area. And they would take the money and either telegraph it up or physically send the money with a courier to your family. And so they had their own cars. This is an example of one of them. I believe this picture is either Nashville or maybe Atlanta. I'm not sure where this picture was taken. Also notice this little popcorn stand back here. I thought that was really cool. Uh, and notice, uh, by the way, there are no automobiles. If you come off the train, this is your 57 Chevy right here. But anyways, doing some research, and I found this ad in the New York Times for the Adams Express Company advertising their service to my railroad. Burnside's Army at the time was 1862 at Acquire Creek. And I do know that express cars ran on my railroad because I have copies of conductor's reports that list express. So uh, as a result of that, I did build an express car for my railroad. Now, this is an example of perhaps the first Air Force One, the car for the president. This is at City Point, and Lincoln liked visiting troops. They loved getting out of Washington, can you blame them? And so he visited City Point, I believe twice, and they took a passenger car and they lined it with lead to make it somewhat bulletproof. And he would ride up to the front line and, and witness the action. In fact, Lincoln is the only president sitting president to come under enemy fire while serving as the president. And that happened up at Fort Stevens in Maryland. And he was standing on the parapet and Southern snipers were shooting at him. 
And allegedly the Colonel who's there, who later became Supreme Court Justice told him, if you don't get down from there, you're a damn fool. So that was kind of interesting. Back in Alexandria, however, the US Military Railroad was building a car dedicated for the president. So this really would be the first Air Force One. However, Lincoln did not like this car. It was too ostentatious for him. And so he only rode in it uh, for his funeral. And so here's a model I built of that car for the b and Museum. This is a 1 32nd scale model, and it is decorated for the funeral service. So they had this black bunting on it, and up here they had some black bunting, and they removed this railing because at each stop, they would take his coffin out of the car, bring it inside and put it on exhibit. So they had to remove that railing. And actually that railing was replaceable, but uh, for the model, they wanted it off to, because we also built the model, or I built the model of the coffin for them and the veteran reserve guards who were guarding it. Um, so anyway, Lincoln rode this with his son after he was assassinated. They took him back to Springfield. In terms of locomotives, I tell people you can have whatever locomotive you want as long as it's a 440. It's not entirely true, but for my railroad, it is. My railroad ran all 440s. Uh, they did have an 080, which Hopped did not like. It was an 1840s locomotive. And when they built the big bridge over Potomac Creek, he said, run the Washington out over it. That was the name of the locomotive. And if it falls in the river, no one will care. But it didn't fall in the river, so the engine did survive. Eventually, someday I have to build a model of it. But most of mine were four for O's. And just look how intricate and highly decorated these locomotives were back then. This one is named after Devereaux, who was a superintendent of the Virginia Railroads. And he was in charge of my railroad, but we had a superintendent named Wilbur Weirman Wright working, uh, reporting to him daily. And in fact, Wright wrote to Devereaux every day and those letters got saved. So I read many of them. They're mostly admin stuff, but every now and then there you get a, an interesting gem. This picture, by the way, is taken in Alexander Roundhouse. This facility is all gone now. Now, here's an example of a non-440. And if, if you want to model engines with diversity, non 440s, and you really need to model a Penzi, the B&O, or the Northern Central, they had a much more variety in their engines. They had Camelbacks, they had mud diggers, uh, 080s, uh, some consolidations. In fact, if you like coal railroading, the railroad to model would be the Northern Central, which comes down from the Harrisburg area down to Baltimore. And it goes through some pretty scenery too, so it would be a good one to model. This is at the B&O Museum, and a great museum if you haven't been, definitely worth a visit. For me, it's like going into, uh, I don't know, the promised land. I just sit there in the middle and soak it all in. So these are some other things, and if I was doing the full talk, I would go into these in more detail, but I'm just going to list them here, and I will go into a little detail on some of them, but not all of them. So I mentioned steam engines. Uh, remember that rail back then was mostly iron, mostly wrought iron. Wrought iron had to be made in 40 pound batches back then through the puddling process. There were some steel rails in use, but at that time they were made in England and imported. So for example, the B&O had steel rail stockpiled at Harpers Ferry, which the Southerners stole at the beginning of the war. Jackson, that was part of the stuff that he stole. They brought it down and used it to build a line from Manassas to Centerville. After they abandoned that line, they left the rail in place. After the war, the B&O reclaimed that rail and it was still good enough shape to go back into their service. So steel rail lasts way longer than wrought iron rail. Wrought iron rail wears out pretty quickly. And stub switches versus uh, blade switches, I'll show you that in a second. We did have the early use of the telegraph, but a lot of times the military would monopolize the telegraph and the railroads couldn't get their messages through. And so they would just fall back on straight timetable and train order. Or if there was a lot of military action, like railroads being cut by cavalry and things, they would run their trains and convoys. Lincoln pin couplers are interesting. I'll show you that a little bit more, but it was the early form of linking cars together before the coupler was invented, the automatic safety coupler, which coincidentally was invented by a man named Cheney, who was from Alexandria, and he was a Confederate military officer. 
But there is a street here named after him. It would be interesting to see if they changed the name of that one. Uh, there were handbrakes on one truck only. And what that means is that it was fairly easy, quote, for me to have some working brakes on my cars. And I'll show you an example of that. There was the first use of hospital cars. Prior to uh, the union building these hospital cars, a hospital or an ambulance freight car was just basically a box car that they would put clean hay in there, or they call it a straw actually. And you will see if you look at uh, invoices for um, milk or correction medical supplies, that they would list clean straw and bandages together as one of the, their medical supplies. I mentioned car ferries earlier. Uh, we all have some photography. In, in the Civil War, there were about 6,000 pictures of the Civil War. About 3,000 of those in the archives are uh, portraits. So the others are, are pictures of scenery and such. And the railroad, Harp, Herman Hopp, hired a photographer uh, named Russell, who was actually a military officer at the time, to take pictures of his operation. So we have a lot of good pictures of the US Military Railroad. And Russell went on to become the photographer for the Transatlantic Railroad. So if you look at a lot of those photos, you'll see that they were taken by the same guy. And the structure of railroads was a big thing. Uh, the key point to remember here, and this was true in the Civil War, and it's true to today, it's very difficult to completely destroy a railroad and take it out of service because they can be quickly put back in service. For example, even the bridges, they got to the point where they could build bridges quicker than they could almost tear them down. At one point during the uh, Atlanta campaign, some of the Confederate cavalry got behind Sherman's army and burned down part of the tunnel on the Western Atlantic. And so the word got back to the Southern soldiers that the tunnel had been destroyed. And one soldier said, well, no big deal. Sherman's probably got a spare. And what he was referring to is how quickly they could rebuild things. So this example of a stub switch there's a couple of them here, but this one in particular is interesting because this is actually a double slip stub switch. Because this, this um, turnout control stand actually sets four different routes. So now if you look at this car here and follow it down the rail, if you get here and that thing isn't turned, you are gonna derail. And therein lies the problem with a stub switch. It, it functions like a modern derail. And in around the 1870s, there was an accident in Colorado where a passenger train went across the rails like this and derailed and killed 60 people. And that was the impetus for Congress to outlaw stub switches on mainline. But some of them did survive on narrow gauge and, and other railroads. To this day, there's a few of them left around. Good news is they're pretty easy to scratch though because you don't have to file those, those points. Now, one other thing, I mentioned that there wasn't a lot of steel and iron was also in limited supply. So everything pretty much was made with wood reinforced with wrought iron. And so here you see a wooden truss with wrought iron bars holding it. And I think the amazing thing about this bridge is this section in the middle is a swing bridge. So it can move out of the way to let steamboats pass. And they have a telegraph line on the top. That's not a radio antenna or anything. And what this little boy is doing here, I have no idea. Now, if you like big bridges, there were big bridges in the Civil War. This is one, an example of a trestle that was replaced the existing truss on stone piers down in Farmville. So when the Confederates were retreating in 1865, they burned this bridge and the US Military Railroad rebuilt it as a trestle for a while and then it was rebuilt to the truss. After the war, the U.S. Military Railroad existed for about one year, and their objective was to rebuild all the railroads so they were at least in serviceable condition. And at least one source I've read says that they may have been in better shape than they were before the war, except for the loss of their slaves, although other people argue with me on that one. Now, in terms of operations, uh, timetable and train order is what they're using. This is an example of a train sheet for the Orange and Alexander, which was run by the US Military Railroad. So here you see Alexander, where I live, and it goes out to, uh, this is Brandy Station, but it, these stations changed as the Army advanced back and forth. Uh, so in this particular time period, they were going out to Brandy. And this is the early stage of 
train order and timetable. And so that's what we do on my road. And I find it, I really like timetable and train order because it's a little more cerebral than just following signals or doing track warrants and stuff. So you have to kind of look at the schedule and interpret what's going to happen and then regulate your movements according to that. Now, I'm not going to cover the rest of these in too much detail. I've covered some of them. There were, were a lot of accidents in the Civil War, soldiers getting killed, um, civilians getting killed. There's a book called Re Recollections of a Southern Railroad Man by, I think his name was Snowden Bell. And if you're interested in this era and early railroading, I recommend you read it. But one of the things that I, I found remarkable about that book was he started before the Civil War and goes up to about the 1910s. And at least once a year, he was a conductor. Once a year, a passenger on his train was killed. Usually they were drunks falling off the train, but other times they were straight up accidents. And so accidents were a big issue. Uh, I mentioned that the railroad couldn't really use a telegraph, uh, so they, unless they had a dedicated line. And so they tended not to use it that much. I mentioned this already. There was a lot of guerrilla action. And so if you're operating or built modeling a railroad that's in active combat, you will be running your trains in convoys because of this guerrilla action. And everyone's heard about the Great Chase. I don't cover it too much in this talk, except to say that the first medals of honor were issued to seven of the men on the Union side from the Great Chase. Herman Hoppe, I mentioned his name a few times already. He was a West Point graduate. He was uh, never really served in the military prior to the Civil War. He was uh, very instrumental with the Pennsylvania Railroad, built a lot of bridges. He wrote a book on military or railroad bridging and then later on military railroad bridging. And at the time of the war, when the war broke out, he was involved in digging or digging and building the Hoosick Tunnel. He was the chief engineer. So they brought him down and he took over the railroads in Virginia. He was actually second in command. There was another guy named, uh, oh, I forgot his name. I'll think of it in a second, um, who was in charge. And uh, that guy was from the Erie and uh, Hop was underneath him. And he came up with these principles. And if you look at number three, trains reaching the front unload immediately. This really bugged Hop uh, because the quartermasters had a tendency to stockpile the cars because it was easy to keep stuff stored in the car. And that paralyzed the railroads. And in World War II, everyone's heard about the Red Ball Express and how Patton ran out of supplies in September of 44. The reason for this was that the quartermaster did not read Hop's book. And they were taking boxcars from the French coast, shipping them forward, and then using the boxcars as warehouses. So they had a shortage of boxcars. As a result, they had to set up the Red Ball Express, which was a line of trucks to bring the fuel and supplies to the soldiers. And the trucks just don't have the capacity that the railroads have, at least back then they did. And so I mentioned some of the other things before. So that's what Hop looked like. He was a little guy when he went to West Point. I think he was 14 years old and he was so small he could not carry a rifle. So they gave him a stick of wood to do his drill with. Now, I am lucky, you've heard me reference some of this before. A lot of the paperwork for my railroad survives and is at the National Archives. And this is the one right on the mall downtown. And so I've gone over there a few times and copied a lot of the documentation such that, for example, this is a conductor's log. So this tells me that that train ran these cars, they carried this cargo, they picked them up here and they dropped them off there. So I could literally recreate days uh, on the railroad if I wanted to, but I don't. I, I actually do something a little different because I, I made my railroad a little busier than theirs. Also, they have these telegraph messages. I believe these are transcriptions because the 32 indicates, this is not a form number. This is, if you read this little block here, this is an abbreviation for I understand. So what I believe all these messages that say 32, they're readbacks. So you can see ones up here. And so they would telegraph the message and then the operator would, would telegraph it back with that acknowledgement. So now with that background, let's talk a little bit about my own railroad. Uh, this is the US Military Railroad Acquire Line. It's a chunk of the former RFMP. So if you remember this map I show you of this whole vast network in the United States at the time of the Civil War, that's the little piece I'm modeling. So it's a 13 mile line right there. And here's a close up map of it. 
So to put you in a reference, this is the Potomac River right here. So Washington is about 40 miles up north. Richmond is about 40, 50 miles south. This is the town of Fredericksburg. This is the RFMP Railroad. And it came up from Richmond. It crossed the Rappahannock River there. And it went to the Potomac River where it stopped. So that's why it's called the RFMP. Back then, if you wanted to go from Washington to Richmond, the first thing you did was get on a steamboat, then take the steamboat to a quiet landing where you would transfer to a train that would be waiting for your ship. And then that train would continue on to Richmond. Now, that sounds crazy to us, but people act back then didn't mind it because these riverine steamboats were actually quite comfortable. Well, compared to a bumpy, smoky, dirty train, the steamboat was preferable. And it would take about an hour to do that steamboat trip. Now, what we see here is Robert E. Lee's army is camped south of the river. So this is after the Battle of Fredericksburg, but before the Battle of Chancellorsville. So Lee is camped out. And because he is not being supplied very well by the RFMP, he's had to spread his guys out. He's got guys down in North Carolina and guys way down in Southern Virginia to, so they could get supplies. Meanwhile, the Northern Army, they're 100, and, 100 to 120,000 men. They are camped in a tight perimeter. So each one of these is a core of about 20,000 men. And there's a railroad running on a timetable and a schedule with four stops. And then the Union did add a second wharf up here called Burnside Wharf and supplied by a regular schedule. And so this is what the wharf looks like at a quiet landing. And if you look closely here, you'll see railroad cars on the wharf. There's a boxcar sitting right down there. What we can't see in these pictures is what the transfer bridge looked like. So if you look closely in this picture, you will actually see a car ferry docked at the wharf. And then there's another ferry in the middle here with three barges lashed together. Notice all the steamboats. And in other pictures, you can see sailboats. So lots of boats there. And the, the, the Union built quite an elaborate facility there. And you have uh, former slaves here that are working for the railroad, or they're just escaping and getting out of there. Um, all kinds of. Uh, human standing around, lots of animals. And remember, I mentioned those photos. The photos from the Civil War were made on eight and a half by 11 negatives. So if you zoom in on these, you get incredible detail. And so you can actually see the rank and such on all these soldiers that are standing there. Some of them are civilians. Also note, there's a woman here because there were women that followed the soldiers around. They're called camp followers, but they're also the wives of officers in the winter would come and visit and stay if it's the conditions warranted, and they would stay. So I need to put some women at the landing. I'm still working on the landing, by the way. Uh, so this is the next stop. I don't have pictures of the stop at Brook. So Brook is where I did some freelancing. But this is some pictures of what Stoneman Station looked like. This picture is actually a, a composite of two pictures. So the photographer put his camera on a boxcar and took this picture, two of them. And then later I realized that and I combined them in Photoshop to make one pen around. And notice right here, we have a conductor's car that's been taken off the rails and converted into a telegraph uh, station. And so I, I actually still need to build that for my layout. The rest of the scene is done. At Potomac Creek, there was a very large bridge. No known photos exist of the bridge before the war. And I have tried. I've been to the RFMP twice. No one has seen any pictures of this. But it was burned by the Confederates. The first bridge was built by Hop, and it's the famous Beanpole and Cornstalk Bridge. They burned that uh, during the Antietam campaign. They came back a couple months later, built another trestle, then replaced that in a few months with a truss, which is the thing I model. And then that got burned down right about after the Gaysburg campaign. And then when Grant came through in 64, he built a new trestle used it for nine days and abandoned it because he didn't like, he didn't want to rely on railroads for his supply. The primary function that that bridge served was to evacuate the wounded from the Battle of the Wilderness. So this is the bridge that I modeled. It's, uh, it's I selectively compressed it about 50%, but you can see the there are remnants of the previous trestles underneath. And they actually built this bridge around the trestle so that they did not have to interrupt any traffic while they built it. So the question is, 
if I'm going to model the Civil War, what scale should I do it in? And I did try back in the early 90s, I tried building a Civil War railroad in Enscale. And I hand laid all my track, I made stub turnouts and such. But the engines were not reliable. They couldn't, they wouldn't even go down a straight track, let alone go around a curve or on a cross, uh, cross turnouts. So here you see an N scale engine and boxcar sitting on an O scale flat car. And there's an O scale engine and stuff. There are some guys doing really nice work in HO. And HO, you have the advantage that's one half the size of O. And so you can get a lot more in. So this guy, Tom, up in New Jersey, he's got the whole station. He's got the ironworks up in Atlanta. This is Atlanta. And then this is LeBron down in Columbus, Georgia. He's modeling a similar thing on a smaller side, a smaller room. I also considered doing a, a railroad in 132nd scale. And I had scratch build a bunch of stuff. And the reason you would do it in 132nd is because all the military stuff is available for purchase. They're excellent figures, all the weaponry. However, there aren't any trains. And so you would be scratch building most of your rolling stock. So I went with O scale. And one of the things you find out is O scale is big. So here is my wife holding an O scale paddle wheel steamer that is going to go into my landing. It's about four feet long. And when you, when you do this, you realize, you know, I came from N scale where things were small. I had to mentally recalibrate myself to get used to this bigger scale. And I, I'm going to need a bigger layout. And at one point, I did have some contractors working in my house, and they were off one day. And I said, hey, what would you guys charge to get rid of this closet? And they charged me 300 bucks to redo the closet and do the wiring. I said, just do it. And so by getting rid of that closet, I was able to get this track plan. And this was documented in model railroad planning about 10 years ago on the whole iterative process of how I got here. So I'm not going to go into that now. But this is the railroad that I had before the latest expansion. So we have a quiet landing down here. There's a second wharf that uh, they built named Burnside Wharf, also called Yuba Dam. And then we come through, we go behind the bathroom, through the closet, out into Brook. There's Potomac Creek, Stoma Station, and then Fallen. Now notice it's really tight in here. And sometimes we have two to six people crowded in here. And that really was not very good. And so that I'll show you later how I dealt with that. So if you're going to model the Civil War, this is the problem. Nothing is available and ready to run. I was lucky I was able to get the locomotives from Schneider Model Trains when they were available. He's now out of business. So if you're starting all over again, you're going to have to go to the used market. The good news is you really don't need a lot of locomotives to get going. I have five, and really we only use three for the most part, and I have two in reserve. I actually had a sixth one that I sold to Bob Brown and to the Narrow Gauge Gazette, he got my uh, version of the general. So I can get some locomotives, I can get wheel sets, I can get some figures, although you have to be careful because the military figures are all like fighting with guns and things. And I need guys standing around chopping wood, doing things like that. So I was forced to do a lot of scratch building, which actually I don't mind because I'm a model builder above all. So I like building models. So that was suited me just fine. And so how am I doing it? How am I building this railroad? This is a shot of the front room, which is largely complete. I'd say like 99%. And these are some of the things I'm doing. I'm using battery power, I'm laser cutting, I'm 3D printing. I've done a little spin casting and I'll explain what all these are in a minute. Photo etching and now with microprocessors with the telegraph. So I mentioned SMR trains. They came out with a line of exquisite models of Civil War locomotives. And when he first came out with the General, I looked at it and I was interested, but I didn't buy it because I didn't really need it. It was expensive. And then when he came out with the Texas, I said, oh, heck, I'll get one just to have as a showpiece. So I bought one. I got a good price on it. And it ran really well. And so I said, well, let me just build a little test piece and see how it would go. And next thing you know, my N-scale layout had come down and I was replacing it with O-scale. And so this is my whole roster right here, although I am scratch building a new one. So five locomotives. Now, two of them use batteries. Batteries are my workhorses. The beauty of the battery is they don't stall if they hit uh, dirty track and they don't stall if they short. And with, because I had some tight radio on my layout, I did have occasional shorts, which would stall the engine. So these engines resolve that. And because I have DCC on my rails, 
my engine just are constantly charging. So I never have to take the batteries out and charge them. As long as they're on the track drawing power, they will recharge. So it's like a super duper battery keep alive. And here's an example of what happens if you go off the rails. They don't need rails to move. Now the problem with the batteries is they take up a lot of room. So packaging is a challenge. Four of my locomotives have tender drive with these big gearboxes. It doesn't leave a lot of room. So I was able to get most of the, uh, this is the battery, the battery power supply underneath the wood pile. And then the decoder and the speakers are in the, in the boiler. Now, if you're gonna just go with Tsunami Soundtracks decoders, which is what I have in three of them, those are smaller and easier to package, but the shorts can cause a problem unless you use Keep Alive. And uh, this is a sugar cube speaker, which sounds remarkably good. And this is another one with a uh, bass reflex from, I forget the company that made them, but I built this baffle and enclosure and both of these sound really good. So packaging is a little easier. Now I mentioned laser cutting. I have a laser for my business. This is the first one I owned and then I upgraded to that one. And I've been cutting a lot of stuff. You can, Engrave, which is what this is, an engraved sign, or you can even cut little fine details. So these are the seats to a passenger car, all made with my laser. And you know they say when, when all you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So I use my laser for everything. And what can you cut? Well, wood, acrylic, not really styrene because styrene melts. Definitely not vinyl, which is a bummer because it would be nice to be able to cut vinyl. But vinyl releases chlorine gas, which will destroy your machine. And if you have enough power, you can cut metal, but I don't. And so here you can see a kit I made for my business. This is a coal dock from Thurman. Here we have my car cards made out of clear plastic. And even this little sign was made on the laser. I built a bridge and because the parts were so precisely cut and these, by the way, these parts for the real bridge were uh, manufactured in Alexandria prefabricated and then shipped down to Potomac Creek and assembled on site. So it kind of did the same thing I did, pre-cut all the parts. And because they were so precise, the bridge just jigged itself. And I'll show you a picture of that bridge later. I also sell these for O-scale models. This is a detail uh, early carpenter set with saws and planes and things like that and a workbench. I've scratch built all my rolling stock and most of my trucks, I think I have two commercial trucks on my road. They're too expensive to buy commercially. That's why I made it myself. They like 40 to $50 per set. And I can do a whole car for about 20 bucks. And so here you see, there's a combination box car. There's a flat car, a couple box cars. There's my express car. I painted a different color just for fun. Uh, I also built a conductor's car. And this particular model was for the uh, AP program to get Master Model Railroader, which I did get a couple of years ago or last year, I guess, during COVID. And so as a result of that, I did do a fully detailed interior on it. And if you look closely here, these are reductions of the actual paperwork and include a little O-scale pencil. My wife likes the pillow on the mattress. Now I mentioned that we use Lincoln pin couplers and for the pins, I'm just using Atlas track nails. So they are magnetic. This is a standard boxcar, a boxcar. It's a little trickier on the nose of the engine because we're using this extended link, which has a smaller link. So to get the track nail in, it's a little tighter. It takes a little more effort. But I do have a prohibition on my railroad. I do, don't want people pushing with this uh, extended coupler more than two cars. You can pull a whole train, but you can't push. Because of the tender drive, that's just too much force on the nose and it can cause the engine to derail. But it doesn't, doesn't cause an issue if you pull. So here's a little video of a fellow, one of my operators, doing a cut. So he just pulled the pin, and now he's telling his engineer to move forward. We use two-man crews. So he's going to back up and drop off a couple of those cars at Stillman Station. Now I mentioned spin casting. I don't do it too much. In fact, if anybody wants to buy this from me, um, I think I would sell it. This is the vulcanizer where you put, you make your mold. And then this is the actual spin caster that spins it. That's what it looks like inside. You melt the metal here and then you pour it in the top. It goes into this hole and spins out and it can make metal parts. So if you need a lot of any one thing, it's really good. 
So for example, I made these cannons. The cannon barrels and the wheels are spin cast. The chassis is laser cut wood. And then the little details are photo etched brass. And photo etching is, what is that? Well, it's a process where you use a photography to create a master and then you dip the thing in acid and it eats away wherever the resist isn't and you get these very finely detailed parts. The drawback is uh, it's expensive because I use I don't do it at home. I have professionals do it at Massachusetts. And it's ex, uh, it has some of these limitations which you'll have to get used to. The other problem is it has to be flat. So you really can't build a 3D shape unless it folds up. Now here's an example of one of my switch stands that is made with stainless steel photo etched. And what you see there is he's switching the stub turnout. And what's interesting is that switch stand is the full O scale size. That's how big it would be. So when you're switching it, you're actually moving a scale size switch stand, which I thought was really cool. Also, the bridles and stuff are very close to scale. So I, I'm not Proto 48, but I tell people I'm what I call fine scale because I'm at five foot gauge, but I have four spikes per tie. I have rough wood ties. I have scale size switch stands. So and I have the, the rail joiners back then were actually wood. And so I have those in appropriate locations on my road every 28 feet. So what can you photo etch? Well, mostly metal. It's stronger than uh, the comparable pieces of wood, but it is expensive to get that first one. It's like four or $500 to get your first test run. And then after that, it's uh, a little less expensive. The problem I have is in the Civil War, there isn't a lot of metal that you can photo etch. And so usually I'm laser cutting wood to build what I want to build. And speaking of the brakes, here's an example of the working brakes using photo etch parts. So there's a car with the brakes not set. Then you would turn the handbrake. Don't turn it too high because you could derail the truck. And then it'll hold the cars. And then you can release them. Now we don't use the brakes that much during an op session. If you go to, uh, if you have to park a car at Potomac Creek, there's a little grade on that siding. And so those are the cars that get the brakes. And so you can go in there and turn the brakes and park those cars. But as a conductor, you need to make sure that all the brakes are released on your trains when you're operating. Now I have gotten into 3D printing and I wish I had started earlier because this is really gonna dominate the future. And the first forays were, I had a guy named Eric Cox do the drawings for me. Shapeways would print them, and then I made metal castings out of that particular object. And this, by the way, is an example of a laser cut truck. This is Proto 48. So you can see the difference in width between a Proto 48 and a non Proto 48. It's about the thickness of one beam. So it's not too bad. I'm also starting to scratch build my own locomotive. And here's uh, the first case, although I need to change most of this. But this is all 3D printed right here, except for maybe the mesh. And this is a piece of brass right here. I would like to have a telegraph on my railroad. And I did this like a defense contractor. So you know, I did that for 30 years. And what I did was I wrote a specification. And I sent it to uh, Seth Newman and Bill uh, Steve Williams out of California, the Silicon Valley guys. They designed the hardware and the software for me and sent it back and actually had it manufactured, and I have to do the assembly. And uh, amazing that they did all of that for 200 bucks. But what we have is a system that the way it works is, you don't have to know any Morse code. So you put your train number, whatever train number you are, so here it's set to four, and you push this button, and the computer generates the Morse code. So here it is in operation. Point two, OS train four, regular. So we push the regular button. The speed of it is variable. Now, what is dot code? Notice you're just counting the dots. And the reason they did that was to learn regular railroad morse is very difficult. And they needed a lot of operators very quickly. So they adopted this simpler code where you count dots. It's easier to learn, but it doesn't have the same throughput that railroad moss has. 
but that's what they use in the Civil War. And the way this works is the operators will OS their trains using the telegraph, and the dispatcher who sits right behind me here will uh, write the OS in his train sheet. Right now, the way we do it is people come and tell me that they've arrived, and I write. The, I use the dispatcher, and they write the time in. So anyway, that's my telegraph. It's got a lot of wires, and I've got to run cables and stuff. So. Uh, I don't like wiring, so it's taken me forever to get this implemented. I just have one out of the five stations built. Oops, and that's my dispatcher's desk. You can see it behind me. And um, now I have a cotton flag. This picture shows uh, the old vinyl flag, and I got crap from people for not having a prototype fabric material. So now I do have a full cotton flag. Also notice the non-prototypical cookie jar for my operators. And I, I only see one cookie left, so they, they've hit me pretty hard. Uh, Alicia and my mom would make the, well, my former mom, she passed away. They would make really good snacks for my crews. So I also use the internet and we have uh, research from the Library of Congress, the National Archives. A lot of us do Facebook. We have our own Yahoo group. So if you're interested in the Civil War, you can join this uh, groups. Uh, it's actually not at uh, Yahoo anymore, it's at groups.io. We do charge, like, I think it's $5 a year because we have to pay for the gigabytes and gigabytes of memory that of all the images and information we have. So we all chip in and uh, pay for that. And also I do this blog, you can click on that blog and you can go uh, see what I've been working on. And now I'm just going to show you some pictures of my railroad. This particular scene no longer exists because I've gotten rid of it. There's Claiborne Creek, which is a uh, military style trestle over the bridge, over the creek I mean. And here we see Osceola coming across. It's a beautiful locomotive, but it doesn't have a lot of pulling power. It can only haul four cars. It's an 1840s design, very similar to the Yona, but Schneider's model trains uh, painted it to my specs. So it became the Osceola on my railroad. Here we are at Stoneman Station. You can see one of the switch stands. In my foreground, my trees are made out of twisted wire, and this prevents them from being broken when people accidentally bang into them. A couple months ago, one of my fluorescent lights fell out of the ceiling and it landed on the train and on one of the trees. And thanks to the tree, it absorbed most of the uh, brunt of the force and then nothing was really damaged. So very useful. And then if you get an operator who's a little too rambunctious, he'll get pricked by the leaves and he'll say, oh yeah, I need to be more careful. There's my rendition of Potomac Creek. This is a picture is a little bit older. So I have poured the water in and finished the scene up. And that's the little station. This is the siding that's on a slight grade. So this is where we need to work in breaks. I only have one picture of this area. So I had to kind of guesstimate some of the stuff. This is my favorite scene on the railroad. It's just a single track going through a cut in the hill with the woods. And I love the way the backdrop got integrated with the foreground. So you almost can't tell where the backdrop begins. There's another view of it coming through. It's named after Wylop because my buddy JB Wylop helped me build some of it. There is no water mill on my railroad, but there was one in Fairfax County, <coughs> still standing. And this, in fact, there's graffiti inside this building from the Civil War. The, the wheel is now gone. And so I, I built a model of that building on my railroad. So I now have an Echo Key Creek. And then Brook was another location where I had no photos, so I did freelancing. And so this building is from Manassas. This is from Halifax. Uh, I knew they had a sawmill somewhere in my railroad, but they never said where. So I scratch built this sawmill for the foreground of Brook. And here you see a train pulling into Brook. This warehouse that you're looking at is named after Gordon. And it's interesting. He was the first millionaire in the United States who made his money through commercial means, not through land holdings. So prior to this guy, all the other wealthy people in the United States made their money through real estate, like Washington and George Mason and Fairfax and Jefferson. Gordon was the first commercial millionaire, and he had warehouses at Falmouth, but not near the tracks. So I put his warehouse up by uh, Brook. And I did copy. This is a uh, tavern at, near Charlottesville, and I put it on my railroad, and I have a little cartoon here where the woman who stayed with her house. Now, the interesting thing is, in this particular area, this is uh, Stafford County, Virginia, when the Union soldiers arrived, all, this, all the white Southerners went south, ran away, 
and all the slaves went north and escaped. More than 10,000 slaves got out. However, there were a few pro-union families that stayed, so she's one of them, and I'll show you another one in a minute. She's freelance, so she really wasn't there, but the other one is not. Now, because my railroad has to go behind the closet and through the behind the bathroom through the closet, I have a tunnel. There was no tunnel on the prototype. So uh, I copied Crozet's tunnel up on the Virginia Central, which is now the CNO, the CSX. But I call mine Crozet tunnel because it goes through the closet. And my landing is still a work in progress. We've got boats and ships and things. It's taking me forever to build the ships. Uh, this is what it looks like now. I have an ironclad that I've been working on. And I found that the easiest way to model a ship is to just paint it on your backdrop. I can do this in one night where it's taken me over 10 years to finish my paddle wheel. And there's another one that took another night to paint that on there. So very convincing and much easier to do than building a model of that. And I do like figure modeling. This is one of the reasons I switched to O scale as opposed to doing this in HO. I just don't like the HO figures and the O scale ones are much better. They're not as good as 132nd, but they are still better. A little cartoon here. This relates to a famous story about a whiskey missing whiskey barrel. Now we do operate my railroad. I've had several sessions. This is my timetable. It looks like the timetable from back then, but I jazzed it up so I had a little more action than they actually have. Uh, they had one train out and then one train back. I have two trains on my line at any one time. This is what you'll get if you operate. This is the conductor's clipboard with your magnetic wand and your extra links and pins, your train orders, and your conductor report. Here's some examples of sessions we've had. <clears throat> we've had ProRail here. I also had an open house for the neighborhood kids, which really was a hoot. We had the Cub Scouts come in in the morning, and then the girls, and then the boys from my neighborhood. And they broke into two groups. One group ran trains, and the other group did a scavenger hunt. So if you ever have little kids over, I recommend hosting, giving them a scavenger hunt. That's what these girls are doing over here. They've got the clipboards with the scavenger hunt. And she's just running a train right there. She's about six years old in this picture. And here's Bill Darnaby uh, backing a train up. You guys know Bill. You know he's a very excitable guy. And so you can see how enthused he is here. But uh, that's backing onto the Y at Quiet Landing. Now, what do I got for the future? Well, I'd like to finish a Quiet Landing. I need some more freight cars. Got to get that telegraph done. Maybe we can all wear period costumes sometime. I do have a general's outfit that I occasionally wear. Uh, lots of details, maybe some figures, scratch build, and maybe expand the railroad, which is actually happening. So, and when I'm talking about expanding, I'm not talking about adding an Air Force, which is the story behind this is George Wallace visited my railroad a couple of years ago. In fact, he called me today and uh, he's with the O-Scale Kings. And while he was visiting, he told me he flew F-105s in Vietnam. And I said, oh, well, that's one of my favorite airplanes when I was a kid. And so I, I ginned up this little picture in Photoshop and sent it to him. He goes, oh, that's cool. How'd you know my squadron? And I said, what do you mean, how do I know your squadron? Because we got the yellow ring around the nose. We color coded our noses by squadron. And I said, I didn't know. I just was lucky. So anyway, that's the F-105 story. Now, we did have a big flood in 2019. This is the actual Johnson flood. Ours wasn't quite this bad, but it was pretty bad. And so I had to remove the floor, which I had, per, I had installed myself. And this time I had uh, contractors put in ceramic tile. So that way, if it does flood again, it won't be an issue. I also added, I had a pump and a battery backup. Now I have five pumps with two battery backups and a water power backup. So we just had a torrential flooding two days ago. I didn't flood. So uh, it's working. Hopefully I won't have any more floods down here. And that's what the new train room looked like after we got all the repairs done. And you know what they say, I had an HO layout up here at one point for my book, I built it. But Model Railroad is a hate and empty space. So this is where my expansion is going in. So I had some ideas that I thought about. This would be a Fredericksburg. So if I were to backdate to 62, my railroad across the Rappahannock and go to Fredericksburg. But these are my requirements. I needed 10 car trains and I wanted a larger minimum radius. One of the first plans I considered was this, which I basically reconfigure a quiet landing and put in a big peninsula here, but I didn't have the loop in the closet. And I lose my crew lounge when I do this, which was not so good. So then I looked at this plan where I would go loop through the closet 
and have a long main line here. And I would just have to do a little bit of reconfiguration at the quiet landing. And then I had this plan, which basically left all of this alone over here and just added the extension along that side. So I loop through the closet and I come into Falmouth here. So if you remember my article on MRP about 17 years ago, I came up with this decision matrix idea. And this is a common thing in the defense business. You make matrices or try to figure out various alternatives. And what I did here was I just took the items that were different and compared the two. So this was the two plans and plan B has a lower score. So I went with plan A, which was the second one I showed you or the third one I showed you. And I did use this uh, to do this closet because access in here is really tight. I prefabricated this in my garage using these wedges and then put it together. So there you can see the little wedges in place. You can just barely see them there. And here I am prefabbing it in the garage. So this whole piece went under the stairs. So I got it nice and smooth easements and all that and got it installed so I don't have to go underneath the stair. I got about that much clearance. It's really hard to work on. Also, I lined it with masonite so that if anything goes derail, it won't fall on the ground. And so here's where I connected into the existing layout. Hopefully, if I did my job right, you can't tell, but the, the cut is right there. And remember I mentioned that uh, there were other families that stayed behind. I knew I wanted a farm on the railroad and I was gonna do a Worthington farm, which is more of my wife's relatives that lived in Maryland during the Civil War. But then I found out there was this guy named Primer who lived right near the railroad and he was a pro-union um, citizen. In fact, his son served in the Union Army and I had one picture of his house. And so I was able to build a model of his house and during the war, two different Union divisions made that house their headquarters. And they consumed a lot of his uh, personal property. So they killed a lot of his hogs, they cut down some of his trees. So at the end of the war, he filed a claim with the US government and he got a, somewhere around $2,000 because he was pro-Union. If he had been a Southern sympathizer, he would not have been reimbursed for those things. So anyway, got his farm, the barn, I don't know what his barn looked like, but this is a typical Virginia barn of the era. And that's a water fountain, a water well, I mean, in the middle. And so here we see some more of the expansion. Uh, the cattle are being used by the US military. And when I first did this, I put a picture online, my cattle that I got from Woodland Scenics, they did not have horns. And being a New York boy, growing up in the city, I don't name that cattle. My uh, one of my friends said, "Hey, cattle back then had horns. They the hornless cattle weren't bred till like 1900s. So I had to go back and add horns to all my cattle. So now I have horny cattle. And here's another view of the nice big sweeping S curve that's going into the closet. Uh, that's the tunnel into the closet. We're calling this one stairs tunnel because it goes under the stairs, but I spell it S T A R E S." And I haven't finished this part yet. I have some track down, but I haven't built the trestle. So this is just an artist concept of what that will look like when you pop out of the tunnel. And uh, that's it for my talk. Um, I do have some books on sale. I've done a book on Civil War railroading, military railroading, which is this one. And I have some others that are, are available. This one's out of print now, but you still get copies. And if you want more information, there's my little company blog or my company website. That's my blog. That's a passenger car scratch built. And they never did find that whiskey barrel. And I would like to thank the following individuals who have helped me, Schneider, of course, for coming up with the engines, and then uh, various people in more or less alphabetical order that have helped me, plus many, many operators. And I have to acknowledge my wife and my, my late mother for all the support they gave me too. So that's it. And we are gonna host a, a mid-Atlantic prototype meet in 22, hopefully. We've canceled the last two. Hopefully we can do it again next year. So any questions from anybody? Any questions from the room? Oh. No, they're all going, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I got I to gotta stop talking. I'm sore. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, Bernie, stop sharing, stop sharing your screen. Then we can see everybody in gallery. Right. Who, who's out there? Let me see. Who's out there? Do I know any of you guys? No. Well, I, I know you, but... <laughs> Uh, Bernie, uh, Russ here. Uh, two things uh, when you do your ops, I, I get it where they have the uh, magnetic wand and it and it pulls the the pin or the nail. Uh, 
what do they do to, to uh, put it back, uh, uh, put it in and just slide the wand over or how does that work? Um, there is, if you go to my YouTube channel, there is a video on there called how to operate my railroad and it shows you how to do it. But basically I tell everybody, you put the link in and make sure it's sticking straight out. So I say, make sure your link is erect before shoving it in the hole. Okay, you'll never forget that from now on. Um, but there's a little video uh, on YouTube. If you go to my blog, click on my channel and you'll see a, a video called how to operate. But basically you put it in by hand and you put it in with your fingers and drop the, the first pin in. And then as long as it's sticking out when you back up the cars, they come together. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. And then you drop, then you have to carefully put in the next pin and go sideways to make sure you don't pull them out with the magnets. Okay. Well, that, okay. Well, that's what I thought. And, yeah. and the thing is, do you find that since you're, you know, that close to DC, that you do more of your research from the uh, National Archives or, uh, you know, uh, Googling stuff or 50 50 or what? Well, um, I was lucky in that my railroad, in fact, the reason I modeled my railroad was all the stuff is over at the archives. Not everybody has that. There are some books, there's some pictures, uh, the Library of Congress, you can get the pictures online. Uh, you don't have to go to the archives. You don't have to go to the archives unless you really want to read the individual documents. And um, most of the guys that model Civil War don't go to the archives, but some of them do. One of these days I was thinking about going over there and being a little more um, thorough and how I collect and organize material so that I could offer to other people like make a PDF or something. I have a few of those that I gave, I put them on our group site. I created PDFs of all the documents. Like, so the way I do it is go over there and just take pictures. And sometimes I'll read them right there, sometimes I won't. And uh, like for train orders, after copying 300 train orders, I just got tired, I didn't copy them all. It must've been a thousand. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's been fun. It's been a fun journey. Like I said, because I, I like military modeling, this has really been a good blend for my interests. It's not for everybody, but it works for me. And if people know me, I've gone through railroads. Like every four or five years, I built a new railroad. This is the longest railroad I've had. I've had it now for 13 or 14 years. So it must be something I like. Yeah, there you go. If I'll just comment, uh, U.S. Military Railroad operated maybe four or five miles in Louisville from 1864 to 1866. Uh, they asked Ellen to do it and Guthrie said, I can't, I'm overloaded. And Sherman said, I agree with you. So they operated it and it used dual gauge track. It brought the cars across from Jeffersonville as standard gauge, mostly from the north. From the north. Then they brought them down dual gauge track to south of Union Station. Then they used car hoist to change them out. And then they went on south. Uh, mainly to support Atlanta. That's what they were for. <clears throat> you know, um, Sherman talks a little bit about that in his memoirs. And what's interesting is he makes a comment that when he was down in Georgia, he saw cars from Indiana and uh, little Ellen in because what happened was he told Guthrie or Guthrie said, hey, I don't have enough cars. And Sherman said, OK, if you ever get a car from the north, don't send it back, send it down here. Well, what that reflects is how rare that was. Normally, you would never see a foreign railroad car on your line. If you remember this, the papers I showed you a little while ago, one of those pieces of paper was the foreign car report for Alexandria, Virginia. And it lists all of the non-US military railroad cars that were in the yard at any one time. And it's basically only three other railroads. It was the B&O, the Northern Central, the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore, and there was one or two privately owned cars, and that was it. So I might put a B&O car too on my railroad, even though they really didn't show up there, but you know, just for fun. But the l &N was a vital railroad, and Herman Hopped in his memoir says that Smead, J.C. Smead, was a, uh, one of his subordinates. He went and supported Sherman's railroad, so the l &N and the near uh, Nashville and Chattanooga, into Chattanooga. And Hop says that is the single individual most responsible for Union victory, because he kept Sherman's army supplied during the Atlanta campaign. There's, a, I have a book on the LNN and the Civil War that talks a lot about it. It would be LNN and the near Nash Nashville and Chattanooga. 
I think would be good railroads to model if you wanted to do like a mountain railroad, but you could also have the waterfront because you had Nashville, you had Louisville, you even had uh, a waterfront at Bridgeport in uh, Tennessee, I guess it is. I've seen the one at pictures of the one at Bridgeport and in Jeffersonville, they had to lower the cars down to the river level and then sort of, and it was more level on the Louisville side, but they had a big grade coming out of downtown to get, get them out. So they said they could only haul a few cars at a time up that grade on first. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's, that's some good info. I, I was thinking one of these days about doing a book on railroading in the Civil War, but Combat doesn't want to publish it. So I would have to come up with another publisher and do it myself. So we'll see. Thanks a lot. I really enjoyed it. All right. Anything else? Can I say goodbye? Thank you, Bernie. Yeah. yeah. I go, uh, that drawing I was working on, that's sitting at the laser right now. I got to go upstairs and run the laser. All right, guys. Take care. Say hi to Barbara. I will. Bernie, Bernie thanks a lot for your time today. Uh, we appreciate it. And it uh, was very, very interesting. And I think we all enjoyed it. So thank you so much. Yeah. One last thing, my son lives in Lexington and I'll be heading out there. So maybe uh, maybe one of these days I can hook up with you guys. You bet. Come see some layouts or something. Well, yeah, just give us a holler. Any any of the three of us, Ron, Russ, or me, Bernie. Yeah. Absolutely. When I go to my son's house, he puts me to work. He's restoring a house, so they work me like a dog. They don't like me. They just love my tools. So you wouldn't mind running this uh, silver stuff behind me then? Huh? Oh, no. I do all kinds of trains. I, I was just thinking, as I have this little shelf over here that uh, is not being right now story models on it, I was thinking, you know, when I get my railroad done, I don't want to do another big railroad. I'm going to do another one. And an idea that I really like is my hometown here, Alexandria, in uh, right around the World War I time period when it was tracks down the streets and buildings and a shipyard. And I only have about a 10 foot, so I'd probably do HO, do like a small urban switching layout. Yep. So, yeah, I do all kinds of stuff. Maybe even N scale. Yeah. Maybe I'll build some more modules. All right, guys, I'm going to say goodbye. Well, thank, thank you. you sir. Bye. Bye, Bernie. All right. That's it for today, guys.